following interview was conducted with Berna Emery, the Office of Publications uh, for the uh, Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Tuesday, January 12, 2010, at her home in West Lafayette. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome and good afternoon, Berna. Good Thank afternoon. you very much. Mm -hmm. Let's start off, tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents and siblings in early years. Okay. Well, I was born in Westchester, Pennsylvania. Uh, in 1926, okay. Westchester, Pennsylvania, is a was a small founded. It was founded by Quakers, and it was a small community when uh, I when I lived there. Um, my parents were uh, working people. Um, neither one of them completed high school. My father, because of economic conditions, and my mother, because of health, they were both, however, bright people. Uh, let me see. Uh, grade school, and do you have any siblings, brothers or sisters? Uh, yeah, I had a brother. Oh, okay. He was nine years younger than I. Um, he was a Marine. He fought in Vietnam, was a photographer, was exposed to Agent Orange, and that was the cause of his death. Uh, the diseases that he contracted uh, from Agent Orange. He, he lived to his 70s, but he was always ill. Um, I went to elementary school in Westchester, grades one through five, in a school uh, connected with the Westchester State Teachers College. It was called a demonstration school. And um, the teachers in the school were very skilled. Um, they were always on their toes because constantly classes of students were coming in to our classrooms and filing in at the back and observing the teacher as she as she taught. We also had uh, student teachers in their senior year. Um, student teachers would come and, 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 and teach us for a while. I was really very, very happy with the background that I received there. Those uh, were always quite progressive too. Yes, oh yes. Um, I grew up during the Depression, and I won't do it now, but I could give you a lot of Depression stories. Um, How did it affect? Did it have a major impact? Oh, it had a major family? impact. My oh. father had, he was he a plumber work? by trade, uh -huh. had a very difficult time finding work. My mother was able to find work. She was skilled in, um, there were a lot of hosiery, women's hosiery factories around Westchester. And she was able from time to time to find work there. I lived a great deal with my grandparents. Um, because my mother, when she worked, um, my mother. grandparents took care of me. My grandfather worked on the Pennsylvania Railroad. And uh, Westchester was at the end of what was called the main line from Philadelphia to Westchester, and there would be Bala Kinwood and Swarthmore and a lot of really classy uh, And that suburbs. name continues today. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. But anyhow, for my first 10 years, I lived in, in Westchester, Pennsylvania. My parents thinking that maybe if they moved, oh, and Pen I should say Westchester was about 30 miles southeast of Philadelphia and about 20 miles north of Wilmington, Delaware. They were the two large cities. Um, when I was about 10 years old, my parents decided they might be able to make out, and this was all during the Depression, uh, make out better finding work if they moved to a larger community. So we moved to Wilmington, Delaware. Um, my father worked on the WPA. Uh, at some time during my childhood, my parents were on food stamps when my mother couldn't find a job. And, and my grandparents were the steady influence in my life because my grandfather always worked and they owned their home. I adored my grandparents and they adored me. I was the eldest grandchild. Um, in that's, real, that's a good end. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. In Wilmington, I went in junior high school. Well, in Wilmington, okay, depression stories. We, I lived literally on the wrong side of the tracks. I had an uncle who worked for the Pennsylvania Railroad in the, um, uh, where they repaired engines and that sort of thing. And the Pennsylvania Railroad had built houses that they rented at a low rate to employees, and my uncle was able to get us, although we weren't employed by Pennsylvania Railroad, a home there. We had an outhouse. We had open sewers. Um, we were 
close, so close that maybe two blocks away, trains went by all the time. I could see the round house from where we lived and where my uncle worked. And there was another manufacturing um, institution uh, close by. There was also a marsh close by. Um, so that's where I lived when I went to junior high school. Uh, the junior high school was on the east side of Wilmington, and I am to this day grateful that I went to such a school. It was made up primarily of poor wasps, like my, my family, and children of first-generation immigrants. Uh, the parents of the children who lived there were primarily laborers or owners of small businesses. I remember an Italian friend of mine, her father owned a barber shop, and a Greek friend of mine, her father owned a fruit stand. Um, I have been so grateful that I was initiated at that age to appreciate people of a different background. My very best friends, one was a Jewish girl Russian, from a Russian Jewish family, another one was a Greek from a Greek family, and another was from a Polish family. So in junior high, I skipped half a grade, and I participated in a lot of, of, of theater, junior high theater. I would write plays and direct plays. I was editor of the paper. Um, when I graduated from junior high, I went to Wilmington High School. And Wilmington High School, there I was introduced to, to um, offspring of professional people, as well as this mix uh, of, of image. So I really am very happy that I saw such a new, such a, a, a span of, of ethnic sure. and uh, educational background at an early age at an early age that's right um was wilmington high school must have been about a lot pretty, pretty good size school oh yes it was it was mm -hmm. now i graduated in january of 1944 during the war and of course the graduating class in january is never as large as the one that graduates in june um, as a matter of fact a number of the boys in my class went into the service um, in their senior year, at the end of their senior year. I, uh, again, I've always loved school. Um, in high school, I was a member of the Honor Society, and I, my big thrill was I was editor of the school paper there, too. And I was valedictorian of the, of the class. Um, at that time, was, this is 1944, January of 1944, World War II was, was uh, on, um, my father, who was working at this one manufacturing class, it was called Electric Hose and Rubber Company, and they made hoses for airplanes and, and tanks and all that sort of used during the war. So they were a war manufacturing industry. And he worked as a security guard. But at my graduation, he wasn't well. And uh, we weren't sure whether he was going to continue um, to work. I received a scholarship to the University of Delaware, but I had to give that up, and my parents borrowed money so that I could go to a business school. And during World War II, people were in demand who worked in an office, and they had special courses, uh, accelerated courses. So I took an accelerated course in typing shorthand, a smattering of bookkeeping, and a smattering of office machines. And I went to work after, this was a 16-week program, I learned these things. I was typing at 50 words a minute and taking shorthand at 90 words a minute when I graduated. Um, so I went to work, as a matter of fact, in the manufacturing um, establishment where my father was a security guard, and I worked in the sales department. And... Um, I worked there for a number of years, and all the while I worked, I took courses at night at the University of Delaware. Um, in 19, let me see, in 1949, I worked, I, I worked there, I went to work in 44, um, and I met my husband on a blind date, my one and only blind date, in 1949. Um, at the university? No. Oh. 
he, uh, he was fresh out of MIT with a master's degree, and he came to work. Of course, Wilmington was the mecca of the chemical industry. And he came to work as a chemical engineer at the experimental station in Wilmington. And um, his roommate at MIT was Jewish. And when Alden came to Wilmington, his first group of friends were the Jewish community. Well, I had a girl, close girlfriend who was Jewish, and Hank, Alden's roommate, and my girlfriend, Alice, decided that Alden and I would get along. So they set up a blind date for us, and the four of us took the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad to Philadelphia and saw a movie called Red Shoes. Alden and I were married for 56 years. Um, um, Alden just, and, and we, we went together and were engaged for three years. We were married in 1952. Um, Alden decided that uh, industry was not for him. And he Where was, was he from originally? Uh, he was from Silver Spring, Maryland. Oh, okay. And he went to Penn State and then MIT. And then he, he decided shortly after we were married that he, he, wanted to go, he wanted to go for a doctorate. And he was fortunate enough to get a fellowship, a Shell Oil Fellowship, to the University of Illinois. So from 1952 to 1954... We were at the University of Illinois, where I worked as secretary in the Department of Philosophy, and I took philosophy and history courses there. Um, Alden was able to get that degree much more quickly than most people are able to get their doctorate because he had a, a wonderful uh, um, major professor who was not a parasite on his graduate students. He helped them do their research and get them through. So after an keep few, moving forward. That's right. After a few interviews, Alden chose to come to Purdue University. And what was the market like at that time? Was there well, it was, it was it, it was pretty good. He had an offer to Princeton, but he didn't take it because Princeton wanted him to do a lot of consulting as part of his his job, and he. Uh, he had just been in industry and he wasn't interested. And then we had an interview. I remember at a uh, another. Um, it was an, it was an industry near Niagara Falls, but I don't remember what it was. Okay, okay. But so he had at least that I knew of and re can remember three interviews. He That's may have had, good. he may have had more, but he had those three. So we came here in 1954, and I was pregnant at the t at the time, and uh, so we had after that we had two children. Jan. Where did you live when you first came here? We first, when we first came to town, we lived on South 9th Street, right across from the Art Center and near the railroad track. A Mrs. Veal, her husband had been head of the Foreign Languages Department, uh, lived next door to us, and she owned the little double house that we had. In a, it was two floors. Um, but um, we, we lived there, and we didn't... And Janice, our daughter, was born in January of 1955 while we lived there. And shortly thereafter, um, Alden, the head of Alden's department... Ed, no, he, Ed, department, he was in chemical engineering? He was in chemical okay. engineering. Thank you. Thanks. And the head of Alden's department, uh, Ed Cummings, his wife was in real estate, and she found a small little home on Vine Street in West Lafayette, a Cape Cod cottage brick. And we moved there... Um, we moved there in 1955, I believe it was, um, and our second child was born, in, in, our children are 18 months apart, um, in 1956 Greg was born. Um, so from that time, I spent, spent my years, during those years, primarily raising the children. I was a member and was active in the League of Women Voters and the Democratic Party and the Unitarian Church. What about the Purdue Women's Club? Were you involved in that at all? No. Well, no. once once, <laughs> oh. once I wrote uh, a script for a fashion show, well, I, for the fashion show at the Women's Club they had in the spring. Oh, okay. And Al Stewart, was it Al Stewart? No, there was another Stewart. wasn't there. Not Al. Al was the band leader. R.B. Stewart? R no, he, 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 he was in he, he was in music. Well, anyhow, he was yeah. the narrator of my okay. script. That's all I remember. Yeah. That was the extent of my 
involvement with the <laughs> with the women's club. You're a writer at heart. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Um, so there were, uh, it was a span of period a period where I I spent raising the children or, or, and. I did, however, occasionally take a course when Alden at the university, when Alden could have his schedule so that he could be home while the children were there. In 1962, my father died, and my mother came from Wilmington to live with us, and she lived with us for 30-some years, and she was a great help to me. Um, not only did she keep things going around the house, but... Uh, now, understand, she did not do the heavy work in the house. Uh, I hired somebody to do that, or I did it. But she would have meals ready, and she was there when the children came home from school so that I could take more right. more that freed you up. That freed me up. That's right. So um, from, the, from the time Mother came in 1962 until I finally finished my degree in 1970, with highest distinction, I'm proud of that. And the children went to the graduation, I hope, were they um, there? Uh, I didn't go to my graduation. Okay. So. <laughs> so you get gifts. <laughs> yeah, well, now, I'll tell you what happened was Alden was on the editorial board of the press, and he heard from Bill Whalen that there was an opening in what was called the editor's office at that time. Well, I was thinking after I got my degree that I would go on for a master's, um, but when I heard about this opening, and I'd been in school for so long, that I decided I would look into the job. And I did, and I was given the job. So, from in 19, I, as a matter of fact, I took that job before I got my degree. I took the job in 1969 and graduated. I had one or two courses to take in, in 1970. Your, excuse me, your course of study, you were taking one or two at a time, or could you go, did you go full-time at any no, time? No, I never was able. I would, the most I ever took were two. Well, that's two, really two, plugging two along. That's great. That uh, really is. I beg your pardon? That's great. <laughs> you plug along, really. Oh, yeah. You know? Well, I was in my early 40s when I finally got my bachelor's in English. Um, so um, I applied for the job at, quote, the editor's office, which later became the Office of Publications, the editor's office was located in Building D of South Campus Courts. Now, those buildings went from north to south, and there were several, there was a series of them. They were very close to the vet school as, and the power plant. And they're still there. Yes, yes. And, and when we would go into our parking lot, we would frequently see large animals pasturing. <laughs> Before they moved them, they used. To, I understand. You remember that, yeah. yeah. And and in 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 the, the these buildings, these one story buildings, uh, were offices from education and I think tech, as I recall, technology also. And the news service was the north end of the building, and the editor's office was in the south. We were very close to the people in the news service. Our end of the building, the south end, also had a dock, uh, um, where books and, and publications could be loaded and, 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 and so forth. Uh, at the time I went to work, there were about nine people working in the Office of Publications. Bill Whalen was the director of the Office of Publications. Um, Dick Pierce was uh, the associate director. Let me see. In the basement, there was a business manager, a bookkeeper, and uh, someone who handled the circulation and distribution. On the first floor, there was Bill and Dick, the receptionist, and Diane Dubeal, who was the first managing editor of the press when it was in an embryonic stage, and then my office, and one designer, Ronnie St. John was his name. As time went on, and by the time I retired, I would say the office about doubled. There were two more editors added. There was a composing room added, um, maybe three editors added, and a composing room with two people in. Uh, there were a couple people added in, in the basement for the distribution and the bookkeeping. Um, but anyhow... Um, 
when I was in the Office of Publications, the office, the function of the office was to um, edit and design promotional and informational pieces for the various departments of the on, university. On campus. On campus, that's right. Um, the departmental representative, whoever was in charge of the pamphlet or the, or the uh, brochure or whatever, would bring copy to us. And we would, of course, look at the writing and, and do some editing and then pass it on to the dis- graphic designer who would, would carry it through. Um, Diane, let's see, do I need, do I want to tell, is there anything else I wanted to tell you about the Office of Publications? I I wanted to tell you that my particular function in the Office of Publications, I was in charge of the catalogs for the various uh, schools. I worked with the phone book. I did a little periodical called Monday Memo. which had information about what was going on on campus. But the most important thing, and I'm sure what every faculty member read, was the list I received from Purdue Research Foundation of the grants that had been, had been uh, given to the, to the faculty members, the names and the title. And the, and the amounts. Mm-hmm, and the amounts were given. And believe me, if somebody got a grant and didn't see it, uh, I heard from it. And of course... <laughs> from that person. And of course I had to refer them to PRF because I received my information from PRF. Um, I also did brochures for the conference, division of conferences and something else. I forget, but I remember the term conferences. Maybe the, continuing education. Continuing education, that's right. That's yeah. right. That was my particular responsibility as far as brochures. And I did transcribe early oral histories. Um in addition, uh, I was given when the, 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 apparently the, the number of manuscripts coming in for the young woman, Diane Dubiel, who was the managing editor, were, uh, the, the uh, manuscripts were increasing in number. So I was given a manuscript or two to edit also. Well, Diane decided that she wanted to go to California to law school. And I applied for the job of, of managing editor of the press. Um, While I was working for the Office of Publications, I was also given the title of Associate Director of the Office of Publications, which did not mean any more salary or any more responsibility. It's just at that time, it was during um, the feminist um, period, and I think um, administration was, was told that they should maybe have more women administrators. So Lynn Doyle and I were made associate directors of publications. Um, I want to say that the atmosphere in the Office of Publications, from the time it was a small unit till it increased, it was never a large unit, was very congenial. Bill Whalen was, as far as I was concerned, the epitome of a good administrator. He gave you a job to do. He let you do it. If you didn't do it right, he would let you know. Um, But he was not breathing down your neck all the time. No micromanaging. That's no micromanaging was was it exactly. We didn't have any any reviews about our performance. We knew whether or not we were performing well. And, And we were like a family. We Close knit, work together. It's a good team. Good, good team. But outside the office, as well as inside the office, we used to we used to have parties at one another's house. We would go to picnics together. Bill would have us. He would he would frequently have a um, a meeting at his his house once a year to to review what we were doing or what he thought we would be doing. And uh, Mary Beth, his wife, would have a, a nice luncheon for us. Uh, it was a very congenial place to work. He was okay. Um, better than okay. Um, when I accepted the job for managing editor of the Purdue University Press, I was always happy with my job in publications, but I was passionate about publishing. I've always been a reader, and um, 
As you can tell, if you look around my house, the walls are covered with books. Um, and I felt very fortunate to have a job at a small press because I was able to see the growth of a book from the time it was handed in as a manuscript through when it was between covers with a jacket and was being publicized or promoted. The um, Big Ten presses would have a conference once a year. Um, I attended some at Indiana, Ohio State, Illinois, Wisconsin, um, Northwestern, and Chicago. But when I would go to those conferences, I was definitely sort of a stepchild because our press was so small and the rest of them were much larger. But those people specialized. They specialized in acquisition or they specialized in copy editing or they specialized in the, in the uh, uh, dealing with the printers and the typesetters. I was able to do all of that. I really loved my job. So what did I do, actually? Um, we never solicited manuscripts. Uh, they came to us, either from faculty members of Purdue or from outside academics. Um, we published a variety of books most of our titles were in the humanities and social sciences. Um, one of our very best sellers, however, came from horticulture. It was Jules Janik's book on fruit breeding. And as I recall, he either put out a revised edition or a, it was a reprint. Uh, at, by the time that happened, we had a second editor, and the second editor uh, in the press took care of that. I didn't. Uh, I don't remember that we ever had an engineering book, but um, we spanned history, political science, uh, of course, English, psychology, some foreign languages, philosophy. Um, we did regional titles. An example would be um, uh, Hoosier Home Remedies by Garrow Tyler. Um, I also should point out that in my capacity, I not only um, edited and took care of books for the press, but the university itself sometimes decided to publish books that were not under the auspices of the press. They did not get have to go through the review that the press went through. The press titles went through. Some of those would be the Hubdy Years by Bob Topping, and uh, books by Bob Kreebel. Um, no, no, the, the Kreeble book was a press book. I take that back. It was the Norberg book about the class of 50. Right there. Okay. What we would do is manuscripts would come to me. I would write a praise of the manuscript. I would do an estimate of the cost to produce the manuscript. We never priced a book to make money. We had to price a book only to make even, uh, to, to, to break even. Um, I would write a praise and do an estimate of the cost, and I would take the book to the editorial board, which met once a month. The editorial board was made up of, I, I would say at this point, my memory tells me, about 10 people, including Bill Whalen and myself. And there was always a chairman from the faculty. Um, Members of the editorial board were primarily, again, from the humanities and social sciences. We did occasionally have an engineer, my husband having been an example of that, um, and there were, there were a few other engineers, or we would have someone from, from agriculture. Um, but uh, primarily, the, the board members were from humanities or social sciences or education. Um, when I When we would meet once a month, I, I would have... I would, before the meeting, send out my praise to the members of the board and, and send a, um, what we had planned, what we planned to do, how many manuscripts we had, and that sort of thing. 
So when I would take the manuscript, we'll just deal with one manuscript. Um, we averaged, however, publishing about six books a year. That's press books. There could be a couple other, one or two other books from the university okay. itself. Um, when the editorial board met, I, I would, they would have, have known something about the manuscript before we met. Um, I would take the manuscript, and members of the editorial board, through their own knowledge or after conferring with a colleague, would choose two experts in the field of that particular book um, to whom I would send the manuscripts for the manuscript for evaluation. If both came back positive at another board meeting, we would publish the book. If there was a yes and a no, we would send it to a third. Um, after the book was approved, um, or after the manuscript was approved, it was then my job to work with the editor, with the um, writer of the book, uh, to uh, edit it. And I saw my function as a bridge between the writer and his or her audience. Um, I, of course, could not be possibly be a scholar. This was a scholarly press in every one of these disciplines. So I had to depend on the integrity of the writer and the judgment of the two people who evaluated the book as far as the content was concerned. But I was able to discern whether the work flowed, the grammatical errors, the punctuation, that's, you know, strictly copy editing, as, as well as uh, making the book as accessible as I could to the reader. Um, after I had edited the book, conferring constantly with the, with the author, and interestingly enough, some of the manuscripts were like the author's babies. They really hated to let them go. <laughs> but I always had a good relationship. I never had an author that I, I, I couldn't, couldn't really? manage to get along with. It's all mine. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so then the manuscript would go to the graphic designer. I have the greatest admiration for the graphic designers I worked with. Ronnie St. John, um, Jim McCammick, um, Don Carter, Anita Noble are the ones that come to my mind primarily that I worked with. They, incidentally, worked in the Office of Publications. They were not part of the press, but they were given the responsibility of, of designing the books for the press. They are artists. As a matter of fact, in my home, I have work by all of those people that um, is not design work. It's, it's artwork. I also have some by Dave Umberger. Uh, the, uh, and it's, it's not, incidentally, photography. It's, it's uh, uh, their prints that he's, he's, he's done. But I, I am very fond of graphic designers. So, uh, some of them are still my best friends. Um, so they would, they would take the manuscript and they would decide the type font the type of stock it was going to be printed on, um, what the end sheets were going to be like, what the uh, um, cover itself was going to be like, and of course all of the heads and subheads. Um, in addition to designing the book, the graphic designers would also design the cover. I would write blurbs for the cover, describing what I could about the, the book itself, something about the author, and I would write and uh, get um, opinions for the back cover from various scholars about the book itself. I would send out, I'm trying to recall, I think sometimes I sent galleys and sometimes I sent page proofs for these, for these blurbs. Um, the graphic designers just, just as, if I weren't an editor, I'd want to be a graphic designer <laughs> because they 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 take the essence 
of the book and, and put it in the cover. Sometimes in the book itself and in the typeface, they're artists. They're true artists. Um, so when the designer had worked and, and, uh, with, with the, with the um, manuscript and uh, put his design, his design marks on it, I would then bid out the book and the jacket to typesetters and printers. Um, again, I had to send to at least two and sometimes three in order to get um, the cost that it would be, and then we would choose the, the lowest one. We had to bid out the works. Um, after, after I did that, and I would receive back, now I don't think it works this way these days, I think it's all on disk these days. <laughs> But I would receive galleys, long sheets of, paper, of, of, of type. And I would, again, and I would send, of course, the author and the designer copies of the galleys, and I would work on the galleys. And we would make the changes that we felt needed to be made. And then the book would go back to uh, the printer, and we would then get page proofs. When we received page proofs, I would send copies of those to various experts in the field of the book in order to get comments uh, to put on the, on, on, the, on the jacket and in the brochure. Every, and the, every, every book that we did had a brochure with, um, um, where folks could order the, the book. Um, and it was my responsibility to write the copy for the brochures. And, of course, my dear friends, the designers, would design the brochures. And, again, I would bid out the brochures to, to three typesetters, <coughs> two or three typesetters, and choose the one that's the lowest. Um, I enjoyed working with the printers, too, and the typesetters. Sure. Uh, some of them I, I, I would meet at these, these Big Ten conferences, uh, Others would were close enough that they would come and, and visit, uh, 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 wanting, of course, work, making good re relationships. Um, but, of course, that didn't help any. It's their bid that had to be the lowest. But um, then when, when the book, when the completed book came in, it came into that dock that I, sp I spoke to you about, and the, and the folks in the, in the basement um, would when we received the brochures back with the orders. And, of course, I also took care of ordering labels. Uh, you would get labels, or I could buy labels for a particular discipline, even within a discipline even narrower than, than just the general discipline. I could buy labels that would be put on the brochures that would, that would go out to scholars in the field. And uh, the, the folks in circulation and distribution would would uh, uh, send those out. And then when the orders came back, they would send the books that were ordered. We also always gave review copies to like Library Journal, Publishers Weekly, uh, hoping that we would get reviews in those publications. And we sometimes surprisingly did. Mm -hmm even though we were a very small press, sure. and it was very seldom, but, but we did. Uh, we would also always send the library a copy of right. the book, and we would send certain complimentary copies. The authors, incidentally, ah, a point I forgot to make, those people that we asked to evaluate the manuscript in the very beginning were paid an honorarium. Very low. Um, but it was something. Yeah. But it, it was something. Sometimes you get nothing. That's either. right. And the authors of the book received um, a percentage. Um, of the sales? Of the sales, yes. Um, and as I said, we would send oh, complimentary copies, but very few. I mean, we were, we were careful uh, uh, about... Well, maybe to the president's office? Probably. Yes. Yeah. That, oh, yes, that's sure. right. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. And if the author had a request, you know, somebody special, yeah. Um, let's see, that about covers what the press, what we did. Um, 
I can't think of anything that I have skipped. Um, Did you have different sections? You mentioned that you had some that the literature, but you, I think you talked about that, so you know pretty much what the disciplines that were pretty well covered in oh, there. Oh, yes, sure. yes. Mm -hmm. okay. I, I did say some. What I didn't say anything about on the tape was the fact that while I was um, managing editor, I fostered a poetry series. Um, I've always been fond of poetry, having written it in high school, but not beyond high school, um, but I've always appreciated it. And so I guess it was Neil Myers who was a poet in the English department, um, and he was on the editorial board, and we, as, as I recall, talked about it. So we uh, uh, offered, uh, we, we opened, opened up to people to send um, uh, poetry manuscripts, and uh, I was very proud of that because many larger universities and universities such as that one which is south of us, much larger press, and specializes in humanities, um, does not have a poetry series. So I just thought it was pretty neat that this university that was known for agriculture and engineering should be, and, and so small uh, would have a poetry series. And when I retired, they named the poetry series after me. And it was, it was a, um, a contested uh, series. I mean... Um, and there was a prize. And there was a... a, a well, the prize was the publication. Sure, right. The prize was the publication. The, the manuscripts that came in would be judged um, by experts, that po poets, and uh, um, then we would choose, choose one. Yeah, I was I was really happy about that. Now, whether that I doubt very much that 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 series still exists. Um, interestingly, my daughter looked up my name one time for some reason or other, just out of curiosity on the computer, and there it mentioned that there was a poetry so, a prize named after me. Yes, indeed, yeah, I did. Did and you I, do that? Them, yes, I. If you are listed, and uh, they gave the names of a couple, and like for instance. Joel Brower won it for exactly what happened in 1998, and he's got something in there. And uh, 1997, Nancy Eimers for No Moon, so it oh. was listed. Very nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah. And when I retired, I retired in in 1970. Um, I was given a royal send off. I mean, uh, what kind of things? Some special things you'd like to share with us? Well, um, it was held at the Historical Museum, and it was dinner, and my husband got together a trio and played for us during dinner, and friends came from as far away as Texas. Other friends had told them about it. Ah, I must go back and mention that as the press grew, I mentioned that we did add um, we did add editors, but we also had interns. Um, they were always women um, from various disciplines. Um, it was known that we we accepted interns, and I made some great friends from those interns. One of them, incidentally, became uh, after she she left. She was in the school of journalism. And after she left, she became uh, uh, an assistant managing editor of the Wall Street Journal. Carolyn Phillips was her name, and she's in this 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 book that uh, oh, for that the commemorative thing for, for the for the for the major campaign. contributors. Right. She she has a little essay in there, and uh, I was I was really happy that uh, I I could work with these young women uh, as as interns. And I think that's about it. Talk, uh, can I make a few comments about your family? Your husband was with the university. My husband was a, a professor of chemical engineering. Mm -hmm. He was a man of many interests and many talents. He was a musician. Uh, he played the flute. He played the bass. And he played the saxophone. Uh, his mother had been um, a, a piano teacher and a vocal coach. His father, incidentally, was the man who was responsible for the major growth of the American Chemical Society, uh, Alden, M Alden Emery Sr. Um, 
Let's see. Do you have um, children? You tell about your two children. Did they go to Purdue? No, oh. no, no. Oh no, yes, 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 yes. Oh. I, my daughter, the older of the two, went to IU. Um, she spent many years, <laughs> many years <laughs> in Bloomington and finally came out with a dual undergraduate degree in psychology. And um, uh, I never could remember whether it's quantitative or qualitative business analysis. Um, but uh, uh, she, she graduated with, with distinction too from, from IU. Um, our son inherited his father's musical talent and he went to Berkeley College of Music in Boston and majored in bass performance. Uh, he went out into the great world and decided he didn't like the life of a musician. He would like to have been in a studio band, but he found that contacts were very important and he didn't have contacts. So he came back to Purdue and got a dual degree in uh, computer sciences and electrical engineering technology. And he, he works for Huntington Bank in uh, Columbus, Ohio. He's in the, uh, ex in the executive offices there. He does things with the computer that I don't understand. Janice, for years, worked for a benefits consulting firm in Chicago. Um, but after many years and having reached the age of 41 or so, she decided if she was going to have a family, she should quit work. She married an architect, of whom we are very fond. Um, and at 42, she had one child, one son. My son uh, married but divorced. And he has two sons, but a very loving woman friend at this point that I'm very fond of. Good. How old are his, when you got some grandchildren, how old are the grandchildren? Okay. My daughter's son is 12, and he goes to Montessori School in Lake Forest in, in Chicago, Lake Forest School. My <clears throat> son's sons, one is 20, and he is going to uh, uh, Columbus College. It's uh, like Ivy Tech. And he hasn't quite decided what he wants to do yet with his life. He's very talented artistically. Uh, I have a painting on my walls that he did when he was eight years old, which is really, I think, pretty, pretty amazing. He has a brother. His name is Adam, and his brother is Brian. And Brian is 14 <clears throat> and still in high school. And my daughter's son is Evan. Um, so. so that's good. Okay. Uh, let's talk about that uh, Distinguished Alumni Award from the College of Local Arts. Mm -hmm. Congratulations. That's very nice. Thank you. Thank How did, you. did they notify you in advance? So yes. Be on tap? Yes, okay. they did. They did. Okay. I was just going through things today. I, I have a whole pile of things up in the study that I found, all the letters and cards I received when I retired, and then the letters that were written for me to, to be taken into Phi Beta Kappa, and then the 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 nominations for me for a distinguished and it really it would make my head swell if I if I would yeah, let it. You're more so. than deserving of it. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have a favorite Purdue tradition? An outstanding I, I, event? I can't yeah. say I do. What about an outstanding event? Something come to mind? Well, yes. Good. Import, Im, well, important thing in my life is the year that we spent in England on sabbatical. Um, my Did husband, the children go with you too? Yes. Oh. Yes. We we. Um, we ha we had two sabbaticals. One was at uh, in in uh, Washington D.C. Alden was affiliated with the University of Maryland there, and I spent most of my time on the Hill. It was the year of the uh, uh, Kennedy Nixon campaign, and uh, <laughs> I, uh, I I just spent a I, I'm fascinated by politics. That's another one of my very favorite things. And uh, I, um, I remember how very crisp and clean and sharp Barry Goldwater looked. And bless me, I can't remember the name of the chap from Indiana who looked like Wallace Beery. <laughs> no. <laughs> but he, he was not to be proud of as, as physically. Um, but I, I, I went to committee committee meetings uh, that year, 
and uh, on the hill, ate in the Senate dining room and rode that little car from from the, I guess it was the House or the Senate to, that they, to the, the Capitol. Transportation. Yeah. Um, I um, remember, now this irritates me, I can't remember the name of our senator. He was before before Birch Bayh. Um, but anyhow, I remember going to his office to get a pass, and they must have had a secret button because the minute I walked in and said what I wanted, he popped out of the office and put his arm around me and had a picture taken with me. Bless me, I can't remember It'll that man's name. I know, yes. I can't mm -hmm. either. It's before, before, yeah, before Birch Ev by. Before Evan by. Oh, okay. For, but for him. Now, that, that year was outstanding. Yeah. And so was the year that we, we lived in, in England. All, we were at the University of Leeds, which is a red brick university. And uh, Alden taught it at Leeds. And uh, um, we traveled Europe. We camped a lot. Uh, Un until it was a bad weather or we felt we really needed a better shower and we would stay at a hotel. Uh, yeah, Jan and Greg were about 11 and 12 uh, that year. Greg was able to get into their one of their public schools, which is like a private school. Right, yeah. um, so he was fortunate. Janice wasn't able to, and she... They they have this test, as you know, in England that kids take when they're 12, which determines where they're going to go academically. Well, Janice definitely, who was an excellent student, belonged to be able to go to the public school that, that, that like Greg went to. But they were full and couldn't take her, so she was put in with the girls who were going to be like secretaries and, and, and clerks and that sort of thing. And she didn't have to work the whole blooming year. She was the youngest one in the class, but she loved the girls and loved her teachers. Yeah, so good time. so okay. it, it was a good was a good experience. <laughs> it was a good experience. So, um, but that that was that was really a, a, amazing. All the, I don't know whether you want to record this this sort of personal right. funny thing or not. But Janice had red gold hair, and at twelve. She looked older, um, and she picked up southern Mediterranean boys. Now, understand, we were there all the time, but I remember when we were in Spain, we uh, um, camped near Valencia, and uh, she made friends with a, a brother and a sister who were French and a Spanish boy named Jesus. And I'll never forget, when we left that campsite, Jesus ran after us. He didn't want to let Jan go. <laughs> then another time we camped um, in Italy. Um, I forget where the beach was, but there was Stefano, who was very taken with Janice there, and he was much more aggressive. He wasn't sweet. He really wanted to come to this country. <laughs> right. Continue the relationship, right? <laughs> yeah. Get mm -hmm. started. But anyhow, that year in, in Europe was, was really wonderful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. In uh, how about in closing, I'll get any summary or comments that you'd like to share? I'll leave the for you or anything that I didn't ask that you comes to mind. Oh, retirement. What have you been doing in retirement? That'll close it out. Oh, in retirement. Yeah. Well, I've been retired now for twenty years, and the first ten years, um, I I did. Did your husband retire at the same time? No, oh. he retired. I retired in in nineteen ninety, and he returned in, retired in nineteen ninety four. I believe it was uh, after working forty years for Purdue. Um, the early part of my retirement, we traveled a bit, um, just this this country, and and I did free a lot of freelance editing for the press and. And I had some other jobs that came to me. I don't know how they got sure. my name. Um, we did newsletters together. He was uh, sharp on the computer. I'm not. Um, but I had the knowledge to put a newsletter together. So we did a newsletter for the State League of Women Voters. We did a newsletter for the local League of, League of Women Voters. We did a newsletter for an organization called Kids First. Here in town, they go around and do puppet shows mm -hmm. uh, 
in classrooms dealing with problems that children have. We did a newsletter for the Unitarian Church, and we did a newsletter for um, um, Wabash Township, uh, just the township it, itself. Uh, so those well, that was good. Those it kept, it kept, it keeps you busy. Oh yeah, oh those, yeah. We had know? we had had lots of just fun. getting the content. You know, that's right. always the hardest thing. Mm -hmm. so, so that's what we did for the f first the tra the uh, travel and visiting relatives and so forth and so on and and doing the newsletters. I I didn't get active in in the league or the any political parties at that time. Um, but then, as I told you earlier, Alden became got, had Alzheimer's and, and heart failure, and the last ten years of my retirement has been pretty much taking care of him, which I would be happy to have him back and take care of him. Um, right. I, I miss him. Right. Um, and as far as what I plan to do in the future, this last year I've just been keeping uh, getting our financial situation in straight a straight. I mean, having um, investments switched over to me and blah blah you know sure. that, that sort of thing um, what I will do in the future I want to do some volunteer work I thought I might see if I could help out at, at one of the libraries and, and sure. there's this this one the new one is for a close to you yes that's right yeah. that's right and that would be easy mm -hmm. yeah and I thought I might try to help at Lafayette Area Reading Academy or Resource Academy, I guess. It's yeah, they changed the name on yeah. that. Yeah, uh, I haven't. I haven't looked into that yet. Frankly, I've just been recouping, Katie, from the last ten years. Right. I've been doing. I've been able to do a lot of reading and and I've visited with the just children. Just into it. You mm -hmm. know? That's right. 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 So that's that's where I Good. am now. Mm -hmm. And I want I want to thank you very much for this. It's been a very nice <laughs> and really and the table with all of your publications that you were involved in is well, great. Well, thank you. Thank I you hope I much. haven't given you any no. extraneous information. Not, nobody has extraneous. It's okay. getting the information.